Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Absolutely, we are ready. University of California, Davis, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Steve Robinson with students at UC Davis, Comp check. We have you loud and clear, UC Davis. We don't know a Steve Robinson, but we know a Stevie Ray. Is he there? <laughs> I told you not to say that. <laughs> Hello, Butch. Hi, Sam. Hi, Terry. Welcome to UC Davis in Northern California, where uh, although this is a historically agricultural school, where the sounds be, may be more cowbell instead of uh, rocket, rocket sounds, we have a very vital and uh, exciting and robust, robust program in uh, aerospace and mechanical engineering. And we have an entire room full of students here dying to ask you questions. How are you guys doing today? We're doing outstanding. And I personally speak cowbell, so I understand. I'll understand all that you ask, so we're ready to go. Okay, Is that your name? Ask your question. Hello, my name is Jesus Coro. Do you think humans have the capability to achieve deep space travel before 2024? And as technology advances, do we, would we see NASA cut down on human space travel? Well, it, I think part of that depends on your definition of deep space travel. If you mean beyond the moon, um, we certainly have the capability for that. Uh, the, um, if you define it as going to the moon, we, we did that program in only eight and a half years. So that's something we can do. If by deep space you mean going to Jupiter or the outer edges of the solar system, uh, that's probably not going to happen in less than 10 years. But uh, those are things that I think that we can do. Um, one of the technologies that's going to be really important in the coming decades and centuries is to develop space propulsion technology that lets us go faster. Uh, with chemical rockets, you can only go so fast, and with an electrical propulsion system, you can go much faster and get places farther away. So I think that's something that uh, in, the, in the future needs to be addressed if we're really going to go out and explore the solar system and beyond. Thank you. Good morning and buongiorno. My name is Mark Boncayo. Uh, what is a typical day like on the ISS? Hey, Mark, a typical day. Boy, that, that's, that's a question that you can't really answer specifically. I mean, the, every day is different. You know, we, every, every day we eat, of course. Every day we actually work out, do some kind of physical exercise, whether resistive exercise or aerobic training. That's almost every single day. So those things are pretty, uh, pretty common. But the rest of the day, very, very different from day to day. It's sometimes we're doing experiments, you know, where the hands and eyes and arms of the uh, scientists that are on, the, on Earth and we're employing and doing their experiments for them here in, in, in the ISS. Other days we're working on our spacewalking suits, getting them ready to go outside here in a couple of weeks. And another day we're fixing the space potty because it broke. So it, it varies from day to day. And that's really the exciting thing about being here is that uh, we have such a variety of opportunities and things to be involved with, which makes it just that much more exciting. So every day is different. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Chris? <clears throat> hey, we, uh, when we get to uh, the end of the questions, if there's time, we want to hear more about your uh, EVAs coming up. I know that's, uh, that's got to be uh, big on your mind right now. But right now, here's uh, Chris for another question. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Chigazola. And for Samantha, how do you see radiation protection technology <clears throat> currently on the ISS evolving as we move into the future? Hey, Chris, thanks for the question. Um, well, on, uh, on the ISS, the radiation environment, as I'm sure you know, is not, uh, it's not that bad at all because we're pretty, you know, we're in low Earth orbit. We're still quite close to the surface of the Earth, and we are still protected by the Earth's magnetic field. 
Um, and so, of course, some measures of simple passive protection that we have on board are, are enough to, to, to keep us safe and protected. However, as we go further out, as we venture out beyond low Earth orbit and into deep space, as Terry was mentioning before, finding new ways of protecting ourselves from radiation, uh, that is uh, certainly one of the most important technological challenges we have to solve right now, in, in my opinion, is the biggest uh, showstopper. Uh, so I guess there's two ways. Either we, we learn how to modify our bodies, uh, you know, with, with medicines, with drugs, with, uh, you know, biomedical technologies so that we're not so susceptible to radiation, or probably we'll have to go into active magnetic shielding technologies. So do the same artificially as the Earth's magnetic field does for us when we are on Earth or in low Earth orbit. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Five minutes. And, uh, for the, for the next student on the list, come on up and stand with me so we, we can keep it up. Great. Hello, my name is Ahmed. My question is for Terry. How long do you experience high G-forces during launch and landing, and what kind of process do you go through between launch and docking? So the launch on the shuttle and the Soyuz, I've, I've flown on both vehicles, um, were a little bit different, but, but close. Uh, the Soyuz was a little bit higher G-force. I think we get up to right, right around 4 Gs. And the thing that really stands out on the Soyuz is you, go, you get up to these 3 or 4 Gs, and then at staging, it's a bang, instantly bang. And ask Stevie Ray about uh, everybody get ready for a, for a little bang here. Anyway, that's a story for later. Um, but and then you go instantly to 0 G. I mean, it, feel, it feels like the rocket broke. And then it lights up again, and you're kicked back in your seat. So the Soyuz was a pretty amazing ride, but the total G-force was about three to four, and it's about the same on reentry, um, unless we go into what's called a ballistic reentry, and then that can be usually around nine Gs. I think Samantha's our expert on that, but nine Gs is roughly ballistic reentry. Um, so it's similar. As I was an F-16 pilot, and uh, Butch and Samantha are both pilots too. So, and the F-16 9Gs was your limit, but that was from your head down to your toes axis. And in a rocket, it's from your chest to the to your back axis. So it's a little bit easier to take in the in a in a rocket, but it's still a lot. And at, the thing about landing is it's after six months of weightlessness, so you haven't felt gravity at all. And so I think the sensation is it really makes a big impression, even though the number is not that big. For docking, there was no G's. You're, you're basically weightless. You feel a little bit of banging, but it's just a very small amount. It's not like G-forces that you're feeling then. Okay, thank you. Only an F-16 pilot would say nine G's isn't that much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aaron? Hi, this is uh, Aaron Sermasi, and this is a uh, question for Butch. Um, what would you say was the pivotal moment in your career that uh, uh, led you to be where you are today, uh, that is an ISS uh, astronaut? The pivotal moment in my career that allowed me to be here right now. Well, I'd say the day I was assigned to this position, that was pivotal. And then if I went back before that, obviously you don't get assigned if you're not selected as an astronaut to begin with. That was pivotal. Uh, if I wasn't uh, a test pilot school graduate, because I, I applied as a, as a pilot to be a shuttle pilot, if I'd have never gotten selected to be a test pilot, that was pivotal. If the Navy hadn't accepted me to uh, come into the Navy and actually start pilot training, that was pretty pivotal. Um, if I hadn't graduated college, which there was a question about at one point whether or not I would, uh, <laughs> that was pretty pivotal. And, uh, you know, going all the way back, if I had never learned cursive writing and how to add and subtract in third grade, that would have never happened either. So that was proven pivotal as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, it's a long process to get to get to make your dreams come true. Okay, Bush, that was great. I guess the day you were born. <laughs> all right, here's Kim Jenks. Uh, my name is Kimberly. Um, this question is for Samantha. I was wondering, what is your favorite science experiment that you've worked on on the ISS? Kimberly. Hey, Kimberly, thanks. Um, you know what? Um, I'm like a hands-on person, so I really, really enjoy like when we have experiments, when there is like a complex setup or, you know, you have to really dig into it. There's a lot of hands-on work to do. Um, and maybe that you can also follow on 
um, as the experiment progresses. Uh, so some examples. Uh, recently, I've, I've done, Terry and I actually have done a, a, the first session of an experiment called airway monitoring. Uh, in which we will actually, for the first time, study the gaseous exchange in our lungs and how that is affected by being in microgravity. And that was a very complex setup. I mean, it took uh, several hours to, um, you know, connect uh, a lot of uh, cables and, you know, make sure that we are we're all uh, good to go. And uh, we will actually do it again, uh, and that's going to be even more interested, interesting in the airlock. And we will actually lower the pressure because they want to see how a lowered pressure uh, will affect uh, again respiration and gases exchange in the lungs. And that's because uh, possibly one day habitats on the moon or habitats on Mars will be at lower pressure than we, you know, the atmospheric pressure we're at on Earth or here on the space station. Hi, my name is Donald, and I have a question for Terry. Uh, how does NASA know when the space station is struck by debris that it's too small to track, and how do you inspect the exterior of the space station for damage? That's a great question, and getting ready for our spacewalks, one of the um, briefing presentations they give us, I was reading last night, is all the different debris strikes on the outside so that when you're spacewalking and you grab onto something, you don't want to grab a sharp edge and cut your spacesuit. So. Um, there are hundreds, there's probably, I'm sure there's thousands of little tiny nicks on the outside of the space station. Um, some of those are caused by paint chips left from satellites from decades ago that are still in orbit. Uh, some of those are caused by dust flying around the solar system. The good news is we can't track those things, but they're so small, they don't really cause us a lot of problems. And the space station is designed with a thin aluminum shield, uh, maybe 10 or 20 centimeters above the surface of the station. Um, that when those little things hit, th that's supposed to protect the, the pressurized shell from that. Uh, and the big things that really do matter, we can track, and occasionally we maneuver to avoid those items. Um, and every once in a while, maybe once a month, we'll get a, we'll get a call from the ground, hey, we're tracking this piece of debris, and usually we don't maneuver for it, but sometimes we do. Um, and so the big things we know about, this is good. The small things, we have small debris shielding, and uh, when they hit, nothing bad happens. It's that in between size of things that are big enough to do some damage but in, but we're not we can't quite track them yet um, if it's in orbit we could probably track it but if it's coming from outside of the orbit you know from the asteroid belt or something uh, those are the things we worry about the good news as a pilot we talked about the big sky theory it's a big sky and usually you don't run into anything else and if the sky is big space is really 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 big so the odds of us hitting something like that are really small um, but there is a, a risk there in the in the space between big things that you could track and little things that don't matter My name is Katsumi. Uh, I have a question for Butch. Uh, how do you overcome like um, fatigue or losing focus during your mission? How do you overcome fatigue? Well, I try to get a lot of sleep, and that is that is important. <laughs> and it's very easy not to get enough of sleep up here. There's so much to do, so much continuum. I mean, you could work 24 hours a day, literally, and never get everything done. So you really have to budget your time. And the ground, you know, uh, NASA, all the people that support the ground, support us on the ground and do our schedule, and they, they're very helpful in that respect. They schedule us for our, for our downtime, and they actually pay us back sometimes when we work over. So that's a, one very important thing. But also, I mean, it is. It is something that we've all prepared ourselves for uh, for, for months before we ever got up here is mentally be mentally strong because you have to be because all day every day there's very important things going on and you have to be keyed in and like I said getting your rest enables you to do that and just maintaining a focus maintaining a focus maintaining a focus keep telling yourself that and that's very helpful thank you so much hi everyone um, my name is Esteban and I'd like to ask a question for Butch um, I was wondering if you could discuss the complications that arise when trying to 3d print um, in a microgravity environment Complications with 3D printing. You know, uh, what we did here last month was just baby steps. You know, we've got plastics and we're coming in and they're, the ground are uplending the print uh, sample or the, the information, the, the, the sketches, if you will, for the printer to do. And uh, there wasn't much complications associated with that other than sometimes the sample because of, you know, as you start to learn how close does the needle get to the, to the uh, plate before you can actually bond it to the plate. And we had a couple of samples that actually did bond and stick to the plate, and I couldn't get them off. 
without a lot of force. And of course, part of the plate comes off then. So getting that just right where, because in zero G, obviously there's no gravity to hold it to the plate. So it has to stick there until the entire print is complete, but it can't stick too tight or you can't get it off, like I said. So that was one of the main things that we overcame and we sort of step in stone and learned a little bit as we went through it and uh, eventually got to the point where we didn't have the stickage and the things came off pretty pretty easily. But in this stage, yeah, that's that's pretty much the, the gist of, uh, of, the, of the difficulties, if you will, that we've had to, to, to date. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Reed Gonzalez, and I have a question for Terry. Um, how did you physically prepare yourself for your trip to space? How has your body reacted to microgravity? And what preparations will you make to readapt when you return to Earth? That's a great question. Uh, physical training is an important part of what we do. They have a we have a gym at, in Houston, and the astronaut gym is always full of guys in there lifting weights, doing aerobics. Uh, you want to get yourself as strong as you can, especially to do spacewalks, because that, that spacesuit that we get in weighs about three or 400 pounds on Earth, and it's a beast, and it's pressurized, and it's, it's just really difficult to move around in that thing, especially for the six or eight or really probably over 10 hours by the time we do our pre-breathing and so on. So being ready for spacewalks requires that you be strong, and then um, getting your body ready to combat weightlessness requires that you be strong too because you, you have a tendency to lose muscle and bone. So you want to start from a good um, uh, starting point for that. And, uh, and just overall health, I think it it would not be, this would not be a good experience if you came up here just as an unhealthy person. There's a lot of nuances that microgravity affects your body. Uh, that was one of your questions. For me, I felt stuffy, like my head, the fluid kind of floats up on Earth with gravity, all the fluid float, gets pulled down to your feet, and on space, it kind of floats up. And so I, I sound like I have a, just a little bit of a cold. I don't. Um, it's just you're, you kind of feel like that. A lot of everybody's face gets puffy, and you look a little bit different when you're in space. Uh, that's one of the things that affects you. Eyesight can get um, worse, thankfully, knock on wood. So far, mine hasn't, um, uh, but it probably will a little bit. I mean, every, every, over six months, folks' eyesight ten, tends to get a little bit worse, and that's one of the big things that we're studying now is the effects of eyesight on that. Um, the one thing Samantha talked earlier about radiation is a way that it affects your body and, and unfortunately you don't know how, how it really affects it and when you get back or maybe years later you may have effects from that. Um, we have an Earth's magnetic field protecting us but when we fly over this thing called the South Atlantic Anomaly which is a, a place in the South Atlantic where the Earth's core is deformed and the magnetic field dips. Um, I've noticed this a bunch of times. If, if my eyes are closed as, as we're going over that, like if we're going over that at bedtime, I'll see a flash, and that's a heavy particle hitting your eye nerve. And um, yeah, or we're, we're talking about how many folks have seen and, and so on. But that's something that I've noticed, especially in that area. So radiation effect is something that affects you, but you don't really know it um, right away. So there, there, it's an interesting thing. The most important point here is that the station has shown that we can live and work in space and adapt to it very well. Um, it, it's amazing how quickly and how well the human body can adapt and live. And so we've kind of proven that we can go beyond and start exploring the solar system. That's, I think, one of the most important accomplishments of the space station. That was a long answer. Sorry about that. Phone back up. Phone's on. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Melvin Lorenzo, and my question is for Butch. How lively, how lively is the communication uh, between the American side of the ISS and other countries? And that question is uh, sort of from the false ammonia leak alarm that occurred uh, mid-January, and the response time to evacuate. Okay, if I understand your question correctly, are you talking about the communication between the segments here, correct, uh, as far as our Russian crewmates? Is that what the question was about? Uh, yeah, that and just other countries, I guess. Well, primarily our, our communication is with uh, Mission Control Houston. We also have a, a Mission Control Center in, uh, in uh, Munich, or Oberfofenhofen, uh, near Munich. Uh, also a communication or a, a Mission Control Center in, in uh, Scuba, Japan. Also, we have the payload operations are out of Huntsville, Alabama, and also uh, Moscow. So we actually speak to all of these different centers throughout the day. Specifically, when we had the ammonia event, the U.S. Uh, segment 
if it's a if it's an uh, emergency that having to do with the U.S. segment, Mission Control Houston takes the lead, has the lead for those, and we talk directly to them. And for the ammonia event we had, you know, we have intercom system. We immediately informed our Russian crewmates what was taking place. Of course, they also get the warning tone. They have the display. They can look at it and see what the caution is as well. And we've trained together many times in the months preceding our, our arrival here, and we've trained for these specific scenarios, and we just actually just went back and enacted our training, our memorized response, the stuff we did initially, and then co continued and finally got into the books and started stepping through those procedures and uh, working together as a team, not just the team on board, but also the team on the ground as we liaison back and forth. And it actually worked out uh, according to the book pretty much. There was some little deviations here and there. We had a great debrief and, and had a lot of good lessons learned from the event, and hopefully we'll do better if it were to ever happen again. Hopefully that doesn't happen. All right. Thank you. Hey, Butch and Sam and TV, we're almost out of time. We've got about a minute and a half here. Um, and before I, I'm going to ask you just one last question and ask you to talk about your EVA. But while we still have everybody, let's, uh, let's thank the crew of the ISS for taking the A big room full of smiling faces here. Thanks very much. So uh, tell us a little about your EVA as we, uh, as we uh, head over the horizon here. I'll talk about that real quick. Um, in fact, Butch and I were doing surgery on one of our spacesuits today on these fine, small bolts and washers uh, deep in the bowels of it. We have three spacewalks planned starting in two weeks, uh, and we're basically going to be cable guys for much of them. On the first one, we're going to be routing cables from right back here to right up one module down to prepare the docking rings for the future American crewed vehicles that will be coming in the coming years. So we have to get ready for these vehicles to come, and we're laying down a lot of cables for those. Uh, the robotic arm that's been here for almost 15 years needs some grease. So I'm going to, one of my tasks is to put some lubrication in the, in the, uh, in the arm and, and give it a little bit more cowbell. Um, and then uh, the final EVA is going to be C2V2, we call it, and that's going to be laying down more cables. We've got 400 feet, um, about 120 meters of uh, cable on that one. And it's, it's, it's putting an antenna out on the port side and on the starboard side of the station, again, to get ready for those commercial vehicles. So most of what we're doing is prepping. Uh, the station's really going through the next year is going to be kind of a reconfiguring. We're going to move a module or two and get ready for the new American crewed vehicle. So there, it's not assembly, but I call it reconfiguration. Thanks, TV. You guys are our heroes. Thanks very much for what you're doing. We're going to be watching your EVA. Have a great day. We'll be talking about you all day long. See you later. <laughs> See you guys. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you, University of California Davis Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.